Hi, I'm Jane Reardon at the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. Welcome to Reimagining Law. In this series, we're exploring with legal professionals new ways to deliver legal services to better meet the needs of our society. Today, I'm joined by Judge Ann Claire Williams, a retired judge who works extensively with rule of law initiatives in Africa. Welcome to the show, Judge Williams. Thank you, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here. So glad to have you talk about some things that are going on in society today and how it relates to your rule of law work. The death of George Floyd uh, under the knees of a white police officer in Minneapolis sparked protests and riots across many cities in America. What's the lesson for the legal profession? Well, I think that that eight minutes and 46 seconds was a moment that we all witnessed all across America and across the world. And I think as a consequence of that brutality and seeing George Floyd die right in front of us, there's been a seismic shift in attitudes. Those protests that you mentioned in more than 2000 cities and around the world, and not just black people, but people of all races, ethnic groups, genders, ages, religions, demanding an end to the status quo, to racial injustice, saying no more and demanding real justice. And that is a change. And that response give me, gives me hope that this is a beginning of real change for this generation at this time. So will lawyers help with that change, because there's some structural change that needs to be done. COVID-19, which we're all living in, and I think also was a moment that allowed everyone to see what happened to George Floyd. COVID-19 has also highlighted, as has the Black Lives Matter movement, other inequities. And lawyers need to be in all those spaces not only policing, but housing, education, healthcare, all the systems where racism has permeated. It's an important to join, I think, as lawyers, this movement for equality for Black people because it affects all of us and it helps all of us. And let's, for a moment, go back to the civil rights movement because when there was the, what I would call, say, the Black Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, Thurgood Marshall working in the court, others working in the streets. What was the next thing? More rights for women. What was next after that? Other groups of color. Then LGBTQ. We actually have an LGBTQ legal defense fund. So what helps us, helps Black people, helps all of us. And of course, it's the right thing to do. So what do lawyers need to do? Look at ourselves first as individuals. Take something like the Harvard implicit bias test online to get a handle on what biases we have, because we are leaders in our law firms and in our corporations, and we need to seize the opportunity to make things better, but we need to make sure we are not operating with unconscious or explicit biases. So we need to be involved, law firms and corporations, using our skills and our resources to bring justice, more justice to American society. And as I said, this seismic shift in attitudes, seeing so many people become allies is a moment of real hope for change. Judge Williams, you said something very interesting. I want to focus on the legal profession itself, individual lawyers and the profession. The legal profession is one of the least diverse of all professions. What specific actions can you recommend to uh, corporate clients and law firms to change that paradigm? Well, I mentioned one already, which is first examine our own biases. Look inside to see where you are. Ask yourselves questions like, are the only people of color that you come in contact with at your workplace? What about in your neighborhood, your schools, your communities, who you play golf with, who you relate to? We need to look at what our lives are like 
and embrace diversity in our own lives. So I heard someone say, you know, it's not just enough to say you have a black friend because uh, probably that same black friend is a good friend to other white people as well. You want to expand your network. So you meet people from all kinds of backgrounds because once we make to me that human personal connection, some of those stereotypes and myths about certain groups goes away. So we to be leaders have to make sure we're, we're together. And I think you're seeing more and more. I've never seen the number of editorials. I've never seen the number of articles that we see now talking about white folk as allies, trying to get a handle on different, but I just haven't seen that. And I think that's a great thing. The other thing that we can do is focus more on pipeline programs. Pipeline programs, high school, college, law school level. Programs like, say, legal, uh, legal prep, which is a high school in Austin, almost 100% African-American and Latinx kids who are interested in law. That's a program that now, uh, once kids, I think they're at their third or fourth class, uh, more than 70 or 80% of the kids are going to college. Hopefully some of those kids will end up in law school, but pipeline programs matter or just the beginning, one of the organizations I started with a number of lawyers here in the city and judges. We have middle school and high school and college and law school programs. We need to see the next generation. So I would like to see law firms and corporations do more internship programs, do pipeline programs beyond just moot court competition or trial advocacy so that these kids can find out, well, what kind of classes should I take if I wanna to go to college and be a lawyer? What organizations should I join that will help me with my skill set? Should I join the debate team? What about my writing? Oh, I'll go ahead and take an advanced writing class because I know this is going to help me ultimately in my career. These kids need help. Many of these kids are just like me. I'm a first generation lawyer. I didn't know a lawyer or a judge. These organizations were started by a lot of people just like me who didn't know. Fortunately, I was very blessed and I ended up where I am today because there were many helping hands extended to me. And so that's my message to lawyers and corporate lawyers as well. Extend a hand to that next generation. We have been totally blessed with our careers. And I think with every blessing comes a responsibility. So pipeline program. Recruiting, to me, some of these things I'm gonna say are things that have been said in the past, but I think there's a renewed fervor in this moment because when you see all these statements coming out from law firms, all these statements coming out from corporations, I think that recruiting, looking at historically black colleges, looking at law schools that may not be the top five or the top 10, there are lots of great students across the board and I think we have to open up our minds to those great students, um, including in your recruiting, your affinity groups. I think most law firms now and corporations have affinity groups. Letting those members of those groups help with recruiting is really important, but look in different spaces. Two, retention, an issue we've been dealing with for a long time. I mean, these diversity and inclusion programs have been around for 30 years. And when you look at the needle, the needle hasn't moved that much. So there's got to be more done for retention. We need not just mentors, but we need sponsors. We need sponsors who are in the room when work assignments are given to speak up and say, let's give it to John, who might happen to be a black associate. Let's give it to, to Jane. Uh, maybe Asian American or Latina, because we are still not in the rooms. We can only do so much as people of color, as black people. We need people to speak up for us and to say we have the ability. And so more sponsors, the culture in these firms is driven from the top. So we need to actually see that become a priority. The diversity council is another vehicle that firms can use where you have not only just diverse people as a membership in membership, but you have people from the majority group as well, white allies joining that. I think that's really important. 
those affinity groups are great because it's a place for people to share. And again, those affinity groups can be joined by anyone, but they're focused on perhaps LGBTQ lawyers or Latinx lawyers or black lawyers, because those spaces provide a safe space for groups. But once those groups have been formed, I think lawyers in those groups can hone their skills, can get support, and then become members of the larger firm or corporate count, uh, uh, culture and become leaders. I also think that um, clients are going to be demanding even more diversity on their legal teams because also I think corporations are going to be asked not just what does your C-suite look like, what does your general counsel's office look like, but what does your managerial staff look like? What, what are your numbers on the number of people you hire? Where is your salary? You know, how are you doing on salary equity? I think that clients uh, and, 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 and uh, I guess consumers of those corporations are going to be making more demands. And we're seeing that. We're seeing things happen in corporate America where they're being asked to be accountable for, for who they hire, what their workforce looks like. And that obviously, to me, is going to also affect lawyers. At the same time, though, as a result of COVID-19, many large law firms uh, either got rid of their summer associate program, laying off people. What happened in the economic downturn of 2008, 2009, really negatively impacted people of color and underrepresented minorities. Are you, how do you feel about the impact um, this time of, of economic downturns and how will it affect minorities and who are already in law firms? Yeah, I, I think it will have an impact. I think it is not going to have a positive impact. Um, I think perhaps because corporate clients are really focused even more on diversity and diverse legal teams, that may be helpful. Um, there are a lot of public interest organizations like Equal Justice Works that has a fellowship program that brings young lawyers aboard to work on issues for people who can't afford legal counsel. Uh, they, for example, started a disaster core. So COVID clearly is a national disaster and people need help there. I think you're going to see perhaps more fellowships on the not-for-profit side because there's so many donations now being made by corporations and law firms to try to advance things. But I think that people of color uh, are going to take a hit in this downturn in the economy. Again, it could depend on what's going on in the C-suite and whether and how much of a priority it is to have people of color, but we can't ignore the economic downturn. And so I think it means that we all have to do even more to try to help people find places to land, which is why I'm talking about fellowships, internships, that kind of thing. So for example, just the beginning, one of the organizations I co-founded, we had 60 kids that were already uh, hired by federal judges across the country to have summer internships. When COVID hit and we recognized that kids would lose their positions with law firms and corporations, we reopened our program. And uh, it's a judicial internship program, as I said, and we had over 300 applicants in like five days. We were able to get an additional 40 judges to take applicants. So we have 95 students across the country getting those experiences virtually. So I think you're going to see more I hope uh, more of an effort to try to uh, bring these kids in. And, and the last economic downturn, my recollection is there were a lot of like year long internships, perhaps some would be unpaid, which would make it very, very difficult because um, students of color and from underrepresented groups often have a big loan debt um, and can't afford to take a year just as an intern with no pay, but they may have no choice. Judge Williams, you touched on this at the beginning. I just want to return 
to what can um, lawyers and judges be doing. In particular, many say that systemic racism is embedded in our society. It, do you feel it's embedded in our laws? And if so, what should lawyers or judges be doing to rectify that situation? Well, we no longer have Jim Crow laws where it was just very clear what black people could do and could not do. But we do have laws on the books, I think, that appear to be neutral on their face, but yet generate um, racism, generate racist practices. So let's take that crack cocaine powder disparity, which was 100 to 1. In other words, um, you could have uh, a small quantity of crack, and the penalty that you would get would be as significant as if you had a large amount of powder. It was a hundred to one ratio. That had a very uh, adverse impact on communities of color because those quantities were small quantities and yet penalized at that higher level. That has been changed, that, that, but that was a coalition of judges the Judicial Conference of the United States testified before Congress, one of our representatives on the Criminal Law Committee, the Federal Judges Association, of which I was one time a president. We took a stand on it. There were community organizations, there were members of Congress, there were academics that all recognized the impact this was having. We still have some mandatory minimums on the books that are adversely affecting people of color because the sentences are so much stiffer than they are for other crimes. So sometimes you can be in a jurisdiction where it's second degree murder and the sentence you have, it, it, you're, it ends up being less than someone who has a mandatory minimum that, and when it's a mandatory minimum, it's not anything a judge can do. You have to impose a mandatory minimum. There are, there is some, leniency under the federal guidelines now, there's a, there's a, there's a history there. Uh, the, the guidelines actually started because there were different sentences being meted out in different parts of the country, even within a particular state by judges. And I used to wonder when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, why people from say Tennessee or some of these other small or smaller towns would wanna come to Chicago and plead guilty. And that was because, you know, five checks that were stolen from the mail, say in Tennessee, someone might get a three year sentence, but in some place like Chicago, they're gonna get probation if it's a first time offense. So the guidelines were created to try to bring some, and there was racial disparity as well. No question, black people, brown people got stiffer sentences. So we get the guidelines. And then we come up with a formula and a scheme. And even with all of that planning, ended up with the same consequence. So finally, in, uh, and, and people talked about that, judges talked about it. And so I said, judges have a limited role, but I know I had opinions where under the guidelines, I had to sentence somebody to a certain amount. And I would say on the record or right in my opinion, I think it's unfair, but this is what the guidelines require. And this is only Congress can correct this. And so we can do that. I mean, lawyers, of course, can get involved at every level. Lawyers can get involved with uh, cities, with counties, with uh, the um, state, working on commissions or joining movements to try to correct some of these laws. The bar associations do work in this area. There are so many uh, not for profits that do work in this space, and lawyers are needed at every level including ensuring the right to vote, because there are some issues now around voter suppression in the upcoming election. And lawyers are needed at every level to help ensure, I mean, and if lawyers don't do it, who will? Right. We are the protectors of the rule of law. That's what we're supposed to be about. And so this moment, which is looking toward justice, where there's a hope for real justice as we look at all these institutions, cry out for lawyers because lawyers are the ones who come up with the procedures. Lawyers are the ones that can ensure fairness. Lawyers are the ones that 
take that oath to do equal justice, just like judges do. So we need lawyers to be involved in every step of the process and to advocate for a more just society. Wow, thank you so much, Judge Williams, for all you do for our profession, for the rule of law, and for joining me today. And well, thank, thank you, Jane, for having me. I appreciate it. it. It's been great talking with you, as usual. And I am so I admire so much the work of the commission and the good work that you continue to do on behalf of the Supreme Court of Illinois. Thank you for saying that. You're so kind. And thank you folks for watching this episode. Please like and share the video and subscribe to our feed below to stay connected and learn about upcoming episodes. Until next time, be well.